What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Real Fans FC, episode 14. Oh, my bad, 15. I can't believe we're already at 15 episodes, honestly. That's kind of crazy. Time flies, I'll tell you what. But just me and Adam today, once again. And uh, we got a pretty um, exciting list to talk about. But first off, how you feeling, Adam? Oh, I'm feeling good. Wearing the magical messy jersey. The hottest the commodity in the in the footballing world right now. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is the story pretty much around the sports world is Messi bring his talents to South Beach. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. So last time we pretty much uh, we did a show where he hasn't he didn't really grace us with uh, wearing the kit yet. So now he's officially played two games, one against Cruz Azul, one against uh, Atlanta United. Me and Adam were both a di- both there to really experience the game and feel the crowd and the energy and everything. But uh, I'll get to you, Adam. Uh, what did you? What what was it? We'll start with like just like the general feeling of like the atmosphere of these past two games versus like, and then we'll get into like the actual gameplay on the field. But yeah, well, the easiest way to say it is it feels like a new club. That's what it feels like. It feels like the the first few seasons that we had, kind of like warm up, almost like we were in like a different division, you know, like playing these games and 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 finding an identity, and now. We really are like a true footballing powerhouse. That's what it feels like with the chance overnight the crowds over and overnight overnight. Um, I mean, the atmosphere is just incredible. You know, you have true footballing fans, celebrities flocking from all over. Um, it's the place to be when that man is on the field. It is the, the place to be in all of sports. Yeah, and it's not even just, like, the game, too. Just, like, the energy in the city, man. Like, you just go around, and everything's just messy this, messy that. Like, the city is just buzzing right now here in South Florida and in Miami. It's just – it's it's wild. I mean, I have people reaching out to me who don't even watch MLS or don't even watch soccer talking about everything that's going on. I mean, shit, even ESPN is talking about soccer. And we all know, as us American soccer fans, that ESPN, for whatever reason, has some weird vendetta against soccer – in this country where they will literally will never talk about it and they're even talking about it which is it's pretty wild to see like fucking like people like Stephen A Smith and like Sports Center and like name whatever big American sports host they're talking about Messi and soccer in this country which is pretty wild cuz it's something that's just never talked about and yeah i mean being there i don't know if adam got to really see it but i got to saw pretty much Mostly the Cruz Azul game. Uh, man, when he that it felt like everything he every time he touched the ball, and I talked about this a little bit on the um other show of Real Fans Podcast, that it was like a spiritual experience, like watching him, watching literally I, oh, arguably yeah. the greatest person to ever kick a ball. It is something just like it. it it doesn't even explain like you can't explain it. Like it's just, it's insane to see something so graceful. So it really makes like moments like that, like watching him play and watching him make these perfectly weighted passes and learning and like not learning, um, but being able to make these, these balls into like players ahead of them through the tiniest little bit of windows and leading them perfectly. Like, and just seeing the mo the movement and seeing the scanning and how he can read five players and four defenders and, a split second without even really glancing, just kind of like looking half up and half down. Like it's unreal. It's, it's unreal. And it's like, this is somebody, I mean, I'm a Barcelona fan. I've watched Messi for over a decade now and seeing him in person for the first time. That was my first time actually seeing him in person was honestly a very surreal experience for me. And it's, it's going to go down as one of the best sports, if not the best sports moment I've ever like had a witness it was insane every time he touched the ball the crowd just roared with the messy chance and everything he was on the sideline just warming up going up and down and it was just electric everybody was flooding trying to get pictures of him and then he gets onto the field and it's just it goes like pandemonium and then plays you at the game makes plays makes passes 
everybody's going, ooh, ah, like it's 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 impressive to watch. And then finally, at the very end of the game, 90, 92nd minute, he gets fouled. It sets up perfectly. I'm talking to one of our other uh, t- Tyler actually, and we're sitting there watching together. I'm like, oh, that spot is money. I've seen this man make that dozens of times. There's no way he's not bagging this goal right now. Absolutely no shot. And what do you do? I didn't even record it. I, I recorded it after the fact, but I was like, you know what? I just want to witness this right now and not see it through my through a screen. Because I'm going to see it through a screen for the rest of my life. I want to see this in person. And when I saw him kick that and that just bounced off the back of the net, I'm like, holy shit. Like, that was insane. And then we go to the next game against Atlanta, and it was just a clinic. It was just, he just put on a clinic. He made, he made these guys, I mean, they looked like amateurs out there. And these, these are professional players. I know some people throughout this past week are trashing MLS because of this and that. Bro, like, come on, shut the fuck up. This is literally the greatest player to ever exist. And he made La Liga look like bums. For decades now, he made the league uh look terrible. What did you think was going to happen when he came to MLS? Obviously, MLS is not a top five league, but like that's not an indictment on MLS. It's just this guy is literally the greatest of all time, in my opinion. And I, I don't think it's really too much of an argument. And he so walks like, in. He walks into yeah, any team um, right now. You know, their starting lineup in, in Europe, you know, Barcelona wanted him back. They just couldn't afford it. And he didn't want to deal with that bullshit again. I mean, this is a guy who could have been back at the highest level. Um, and we have him playing the way he's playing. I mean, you said it perfectly. I mean, how but the coolest thing is, is how how often do you get to, to say that, you know, let's just say like if you were to go on like YouTube or something and search like, you know, craziest sports moments of the past, you know, 30 years or something like that. I mean, you know, this is just one of those moments that gets put up there and it's, and how often do you get to say that you were uh, in person to, to firsthand witness a moment like that, a sporting moment like that. I mean, that is um, indescribable, but yeah, seeing him, um, I totally agree. I mean, it's like the, the the term I like to to use is is it's like watching it's watching a master at his craft. That's what he is. He's a master of his craft, and getting to watch someone who is a master of their craft act operate and just and and perform in person, it it's something else. It doesn't um, do it justice seeing the replays. Yeah, and. It it's funny. I, I was hearing, I was listening to like local Miami sports radio down here, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, everybody in South Florida is going to say that they were there." <laughs> it's like realistically, only like me, you, like me and you, we can say we're one of the twenty two thousand fans that get, were actually there and able to see it. But meanwhile, there's probably going to be millions of people in South Florida that are going uh, that are going to say that they were there. Um, and no, I mean like moments like that. It it makes you it makes you realize why it's called the beautiful game. It's like, wow, just watching it is like art. It's, it's, it's unlike any other sport in my opinion It's just literally seeing the way things, the ebbs and flows and how it moves and how he's just like a fucking water bender from avatar. <laughs> he's just like, just being able to maneuver. And you see him out there like coaching people. Like you see like pass here. Pass, and it's not even to him. It's like, you need to go here. You go there, you go there. He sees the Evelyn make a bad move. And, he talks to Yedlin and says, hey, I need you to look on. I, I'll never forget that on that Cruz Azul game. Uh, he leads Yedlin across. Uh, he, le- he leads Yedlin with the pass down the right flank. Messi, like he always does, kind of does those late runs. And Yedlin tries to shoot it for- forward to Joseph. Right after that, Messi goes up to Yedlin. He's like, watch that second tier. So watch that second run. Watch that second wave. I'm going to be there. And sure enough. We see it in the Atlanta game. Robert Taylor on that second goal gets gets the lead ball. Then instead of looking straight across to Joseph or to whoever, he cuts it back. Joseph comes, does the dummy, and boom, Messi's right there. 
untouched, able to clean it up and finish it. And it's just like things like that. It's not just him on the field. It's how he's able to elevate everyone around him. He's made Yedlin look like one of the best right backs in the league. And Yedlin has been very lackluster uh, since coming to Miami and leaving Europe. And, and obviously we talk about Robert Taylor who has absolutely lit up the internet. He was the most search uh, football player in the world. Uh, I think uh, Wednesday and Tuesday which is absolutely insane to think about a guy like and me and you, we've been Robert Taylor fans since he first got here personally. Like Best I player on the team, pre Messi. I, I loved Robert Taylor. The moment he stepped on the foot, stepped on the field last year. I'm like, this guy, this guy's good. This guy's good. I think he got shafted by Neville and last season and this season playing him out of position. And so, and like, he the guy's a winger. Let him be a winger. Let him do his magic. This is a guy who can control the half space. He can get wide. He can take a defender on one on one. He can bang a goal outside the box. Like, and he's a guy who can look for the pat. This guy can literally do it all in the attack. Why are we wasting him in the midfield or having him as a wing back? And I'm glad Tata is seeing that and seeing how well he messes meshes with Messi because I said. There's going to be two players that are going to really benefit from Messi being here. It's going to be Joseph, number one, and was going to be Robert Taylor. And sure, everybody's like, nah, not Robert Taylor. He's probably not even going to start. Joseph, for sure, yeah. But I was like, nope. And then sure enough, what we hear when we're at the game, goal, Robert Taylor. Goal, Robert Taylor. Assist, Robert Taylor. I'm like, I told you, man, this guy is Neymar, like, 0.5. Point five. <laughs> he's like Neymar light, Neymar, the free version of Neymar. <laughs> he's like this guy the is trial version. The trial version. He has that talent. And I think there's no I mean, there's a reason why him and Messi are clicking. I think he sees the similarities. Um, and it's same thing with Joseph. Look, people are I've been seeing a little bit of Joseph slander because he hasn't scored yet, but I'm like, bro, it's only been two games. And first off, even so, in those two games, I don't think he's looked bad. I think no, there's a I reason why he's at all at him. The chances that he has missed have been reasonable. It's not like, what the fuck are you doing, Joseph? You need to put that away. It's a, uh, you know what? Yeah, that could go in, but that's a difficult chance for anybody. So if it doesn't go in, it's like good chance, but whatever. Um, yeah, and it's what never he does never had the, the impression that he was bad. Yeah, and you I, know, or need to come out. And I think, too, it's what he does off the ball as well. It's like I, I, when I went back and watched those highlights and I hear people talking about it uh, and because like, I follow a lot of inner Miami stuff. And they're saying, like, watch Joseph pull those defenders off Messi because, yeah, this is Messi. You want to go after Messi. And Atlanta has probably or I think they do have the second worst defense in the league or something like that. But. You don't want to, especially when Messi's coming down the field and running right up the middle, you don't want to put two guys to him because at the end of the day, this is a guy who can squeeze that ball right in between those two defenders. And you have Joseph right there, one of the deadliest uh, strikers in MLS history, the fastest player to hit 100 goals. So having it, I think it's a lot of what Joseph does off the ball that I think uh, if he had Campana in there, for example, that wouldn't have happened. I don't think Campana's that type of striker. He's a target back to the goal type of striker versus Joseph is a guy who can be more tactical and run with an attacking midfielder and catch defenders off their line. And I think that's what he's done. I mean, even setting up the dummies, like those were big. Like, I mean, setting up the dummy for Messi's second goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a, uh, I think there was one in, um, there was a couple really close chances in the Cruz Azul game that where Messi was just barely off sides or Joseph was barely off sides. Um, so like, look, there's more to a striker than just being a goal scorer. Like there's certain things, especially when you're playing with Messi, you have to be able to bounce off of him. And I think that's why we're continuing to see him to start over Campana um, because he has, he understands how to really play. He meshes more. He's more of that. uh I guess when Messi played with like David Villa more so than like Suarez where like David Villa just knew how to like play with him and kind of run with him and bounce off of each other instead of kind of having like a back to his goal. So yeah, man, uh, I, I'm like, I did not expect uh, all this stuff to happen so quickly either. I was really skeptical. I'm like, man, yeah, I, like nobody did get out of the group. Cruz Azul's good. Atlanta's good. 
Um, Atlanta offensively at least is good. I can't believe we shut out Atlanta. Drake Calendar's been playing out of his fucking mind. That dude is – I still stand by. He is – the only reason why he's not getting more recognition is because we're the worst team in the league. If we were a top team – top team in the league which now we're probably going to be on paper like he's going to get so much more like clout that he should he already like months ago he already is getting more you know i'm starting to read on on you know forums and sites and things like reddit and and all that that um people are like huh their goalie seems really good who is that you know i'm seeing a lot of those comments now um and it's good to know that people are noticing it in a short span of time. I mean, yeah, he's playing probably the best. Well, yeah, I would say it's the best he's ever played for us right now, which is a great time to be playing that well. Um, but it's good to know that even with the small sample size that people are noticing as well, and they're and they're not just, you know, you could tell the true fans they're not just being like, oh, messy this, messy that. You know, they're they're noticing the other aspects of the team, and they're like, huh, you know, actually, this, this guy's pretty good, you know. And 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 their references, you know, all this European soccer. So it, it's good to hear that type of stuff, and it, and it and it uh, reaffirms that, um, you know, all the positive things we've been we've been saying and 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 thinking about him. Yeah, and I think his biggest thing coming into the season, people were like he's an amazing shot stopper, and I genuinely believe shot stopping is one of those you just can't teach. That's just a guy you just have to have the reflexes. You're just you got to have the movement and be able to, you can teach like positioning, but you can't teach reflexes. And Drake has insane reflexes. And the one kind of like con a lot of people had with Drake is that he had poor distribution. But I will say I have not felt like he has had a bad distribution almost all season. I thought he's been very good with the ball at his feet. He has not given up any blunders all season that I, at least that I can remember. I don't know if you can think of any. Um, and then even in these past two League Cups games, I've never he seems like he's always hit the guy who he wants to go to right on the money. I've never felt like, oh, that was a bad pass. Drake just kind of gave it away. Like versus when that's kind of how I felt last year, even though he would make like insane saves. There's been moments where it's just like that's just bad. But now, like, I feel like he's really worked on that distribution to where I don't even notice it. And I feel like distribution is one of those things. Distribution from a goalie is one of those things where it's like, if you're not talking about it, that's a good thing because that means like you're just, he's doing his job and he's getting it to where he wants to go. And then, but let's talk about the other player here. I mean, we talk about Messi, but Sergio Busquets, I think we can, I think me and you both can probably eat crow on Sergio Busquets. I think me and you both highly doubted um, his effectiveness coming into this league. I will say this, though. I still stand by what I said. I never said, okay, he's playing a lot better tactically than I thought he would. Um, And I think because he has Messi there. I think Messi, I think they both really benefited from each other big time. It's like they never separated those two years of Messi's and PSG. It seems like they were, these are two guys who've literally been playing together since they were like preteens. And the La, La Masia in Barcelona, and it, it was it, it was insane. It was like they'd never. It's like you you don't forget how to ride a bike. They just immediately they're back together. You're back on that bike, and they just knew exactly what to do, where each other were going to be. Um, I but I will say I still stand by what I said. You need runners around Busquets. Busquets is not going to be a CDM in this league. He's going to be more of a an actual true central midfielder. Not so much like a defending midfielder. Yeah, you're going to need runners by him. You're always, we're always going to run double pivot. You're always going to have another actual six next to him. Or if you're going to have an eight, you're they're going to be an eight that can really go up and down, which is what we did. We're bringing in, but and it's crazy to think this team is so good, and we don't, we don't even have all the pieces yet. These are just two out of the four that are supposed to come. Jordi Alba is still coming. Diego Gomez is here. Um, I don't know if he, he's ready to play yet, though. We have Facundo Farias from Argentina, who should be coming anytime now. I believe he's going to be coming in next week. Same thing with this uh, other Argentinian defender, um, Tomas Avilas, I want to say his name is, coming in potentially next week as well, which they're going to have to uh, transfer deadline, I believe, is the second or the third of August. Um, and they paid big money for him. Um, these are guys that are coming in expecting to start and play. And, 
this Avila's guy, this defender, he's apparently one of the biggest names out, coming out of Argentina at 19 years old. I mean, he was getting bids from Atletico Madrid. We were competing with Atletico Madrid for top tier young talent in Argentina, which that shows you how far the league has come. I will say that that much. Um, and then for him to come here, that's the messy effect. Um, but yeah, I mean, this it's just crazy to think these pieces are still going to be added and it's just going to make it even better. But um, yeah, you're going to need runners next to Busquets. I, I don't even want Busquets to really play defensively. He he should really just be sit in that middle circle, bro. Just sit there, just like kind of go back and forth on it. Like, because as long as you can link up that that defensive line with the attack, that's all. That's all I want you there for. I don't need you tracing back or running back. As long as we got guys around him like Dixon Arroyo, or if we're able to get Gregory back, um, Diego Gomez, you got guys who can actually come back. And then if you're bringing in this young defender, oh, he's supposed to be a stud. Yedlin's playing better. Alba, I think things are going to do well. The only my only concern was like if we had like a Perlo situation, Pirlo situ- situation, where it's like, yeah, David Villa, you had Pirlo, but you didn't have that piece in between those two guys. And then he had a very weak defense. So then Pirlo was tasked with actually actually trying to play defensively instead of being a distributor. And he just, he couldn't keep up. But as much as uh, Busquets was there because of Messi, Messi's actually helping Busquets a lot as well. Cause it's just the understanding. But yeah, I mean, what do you think of Busquets so far? I kind of, I, I agree with you, but that's the thing that I've been saying probably. I mean, I could be a little, optimistic here you know on what i was saying but i'm pretty sure that i was i was on the on the train of when it comes to that link between the defense and the um offense and being that guy in the midfield that can you know help with the distribution and really link up the attack and start driving plays forward um i knew he was going to be good at that the question was was he going to be able to cope defensively and i think that those questions shouldn't be asked of him and luckily tata martino has has agreed and he's put up a system that doesn't ask him to do that um primarily which is great and i i because i think that's where he would start to get exposed if he has to use a lot of his energy you know tracking back and and defending you know he's not going to be able to be as effective linking up that um attack so i i've always felt that uh if he can just have the ball and if inter miami just play offense offensively when they have the ball busquets is in, insane he's great he's unreal but when we don't have the ball you got to be careful i mean he's definitely good but that's where i think the questions are um i don't think anybody has any question about how good busquets is when the team has the ball. And I don't think any any of us had any concerns about Busquets' ability when we have the ball. But the question was, when we, when we don't have the ball, how is he going to be? And I think tactically, it's, it's, it's going to work if they keep it that way. Yeah, I think as long as we play possession ball, the thing, you, you don't want to get in that transition game, at least as of right now. Yeah, because as of right now, it might be different with uh, Alba. <laughs> But yeah, we don't know and, that yet. And we get Diego Gomez going. And uh, if we get Gregory back and Gmo, the, the it's just, and I was telling, I, I've been telling people this the CDM and the number six and the CDM in this league requires you to be more of a defender than really a distributor. It is a position, it's almost like a completely different position than the CDM and what he's played almost his whole career in La Liga. In La Liga, he could sit back there. It's just that this is the way that the league is. But in this league, he he can't be a true CDM. And that's why you need to have a double pivot next to him, which is basically another CDM, another destroyer. Because here in this league, we think of like a six as just a pure destroyer, not a guy who's distributing. And that's what I'm saying. Like he just needs to be not really what I guess in Spain they think of a CDM. He just needs to be what we think of more so like a central midfielder and then actually have like dogs behind him. Like, I mean, Arroyo has been serviceable. He's been decent. He's been good. But like you get like a guy like Gregory or like this Diego Gomez guy that we're supposed to be coming in. who's going to be really good back and forth like that. That's what you really need. 
and because he he he's not I, he's not playing a CDM in this league. He's playing more so like I almost feel like an eight, kind of way more advanced. Um, I will say I, I heard people talk about it's like if you uh, I've heard I don't know where I heard it, but I, I tried it out and they're saying that if you watch the game, you don't notice or see Busquets, but if you watch Busquets, you see the whole game. So I was like, let, let me do this. Let me do a little experiment for 15, 20 minutes throughout the game. I just followed Busquets around. I'll tell you what, this man was on the t- the center of the TV almost everywhere the ball went. He was right there. And I'm like, wow, like they're right. I mean, this guy just knows how to feel. And, and he's not like he's running up and down. He's just slowly jogging, just feeling and zoning out the area where he's just always there. So when they're ready to bounce it back to him, he can bounce it forward. And I didn't. I don't think once I saw him sprint. So that's why to me he he seems like that that is going to be the perfect position for him. Maybe he's not going to be super far back like a traditional CDM in this league is. He's going to be a little bit more advanced, more middle, more centrally than he is like the uh, super defensively and almost playing like a fifth center back in ways. Because that's what Gregory did for us was almost play like a fifth center back. He would drop so far back and just break things up but yeah i'm really um i'm really excited man i think so what's your ambitions for the rest of the league i guess do do you still believe we can here we'll do this where do you see them in the league's cup u.s open cup and if they'll make the playoffs you guys go through and give us the predictions on each one i think that they could at least Especially considering the draw, I think they can at least make semifinals in League's Cup. I think they should could be going for the U.S. Open Cup win. And I think they can actually make the playoffs. I mean, yeah, the question was, they don't have a lot of games. Can they, can they make the playoffs when they're so bad and just having Messi and Busquets come in? Can they do all the heavy lifting? Well, it's already kind of looking like the answer is yes. So... You know, it wouldn't be stupid to to um, to bet for Miami to claw that deficit back. You know, you only need. You know, I mean, it's very generous in the MLS for these two conferences. Um, so, with that being said, they need at least eight out of twelve wins with one draw. They need to go eight, one, and very doable. Three, essentially. That's the thing; it's very doable. Uh, you know, you were thinking at first before we had we we saw Messi play. It's can they really be that team that, you know, just is just so much better than everyone else? And the question was asked because Miami was so bad. It's like, can Messi just absolutely turn this around? So far, the answer is yes. Yeah, they haven't gone away. That's going to be the test. Uh, another test is when they have to go fly somewhere else. Um, you know, deal with the travel. That's something that Messi and Busquets are not familiar with because even in Europe, things are a lot closer. Um, you know, nothing can prepare them for their first West Coast trip, um, which I'm sure will happen eventually. So that yeah. I, I, I'm very optimistic at this point. I think it's it's been, you know, we knew there was going to be a change. We didn't think it was going to be this drastic and this good this early especially with more players coming in. Um, I like what we're seeing. I really do. Yeah. As for me, I I agree with you with the semifinal runs. I think we've gotten a little um, fortunate uh, with our seedings last year, how much it's affecting us this year, where we're going to host a round of 32 and we're going to host the round of uh, 16. And both the round of 32 probably going to face Orlando or Santos, two not super strong teams. I would like to see Orlando, though. And then the round of 16, you could potentially see a Dallas, I believe. So you you can get through those rounds and get to that quarterfinal. Where, but I, I'm with you, though. Like, we haven't, as for League's Cup, we haven't seen them travel abroad. Not abroad. We haven't seen them travel far. And... Or at all, honestly. And we haven't really seen the toughest of competitions. And that's where I'm like, 
Uh, let's see. And I don't know if these new U22 signings are going to play in the League's Cup. I know Alba is, but I don't know if you remember the roster stuff that came out. Those U23 signings are not available on the League's Cup roster. So unless they can change something and they can get in there and play, that'd be great. But I don't know if they'll be able to. Um, it seems like only Alba would be able to. I'm curious how this team plays against an LAFC, how they play against a Cincinnati, how they play against a Club America, uh, Chivas, like a Monterrey. Like if we get that in the corner semifinals, I don't know. Because at the end of the day, we do have to realize this is still a preseason for Messi and Busquets and Alba when he comes. This is still a preseason for them. Um, I'm curious to see how we match up there. I think those are going to be the true tests. Um, but I do think we can make it to the semifinals. I don't know if we advance to the semifinals. I think a lot of it depends on the, the draw. And once you start getting into that semifinals, you're going to talk about, I mean, you're talking about some of the, like, you're going to probably face one of the big gigantes of Mexico. Like, a, yeah. like, a, like I said, like a Chivas or a Club or Monterrey or, who, or whoever. And then, or if not, you're probably going to face an LAFC, a Cincinnati, uh, a Seattle. You know, these are tough teams. And we don't know if that's going to be a way, how close it's going to be, you know. So I, I think semifinals is a is a realistic bet. And uh, I think I think we could realistically get third place. I, I think it's attainable. Winning the whole thing, I don't think the team is necessarily ready yet. Um, also, I'm not sure if they want to. Because if you look at the schedule, the final, when is the League's Cup final? League's Cup final, I believe. I remember looking at this. Let's see when the League's Cup final is. Not say. Why does it not say the League's Cup final? Do you see it? I do not. August 19th. There you go. August 19th. So, let me show you the schedule right here. So, the League's Cup final is August 19th. So that's if they make the final. There's a game, which will probably get moved most likely. Inter-Miami versus Charlotte, August 20th. Yeah, that'll get moved. Then, U.S. Open Cup game, August 23rd, only three days later. Against Cincinnati. And then, you play New York Red Bulls, August 26th. And then, Nashville, August 30th. And then, LAFC, September 3rd. I mean, you're talking about within, what is that, 13 days? One, two, three, four, five games. Five games in 13 days. That's, I'm really curious to see how Tata really handles the lineup. How much do you play Messi? Like, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So, um, as for US Open Cup, I think we win it. I, I'm going to go out and say we win the Open Cup. We go out there, we get our first trophy, yeah. first legitimate trophy. Cincinnati's tough. Cincinnati's a tough team. Obviously, they just won 3 1 against uh, Chivas, one of the best teams in Mexico. This is this, this Cincinnati team is no joke. It's going to be the best test that Messi's played so far, at least. Um, that's going to be a tough game. And you're at Cincinnati, which is a very rabid fan base. But I think we can get through that. I think once you get through Cincinnati, I'm not scared of Real Salt Lake or Houston. I'm not scared of those. And I think this team can get through Cincinnati. So I think they win that. As for the playoffs, it's going to be tough. If the schedule is properly spaced out, I would feel way more sure about it. What I'm worried about is how close the schedule is and I believe we're playing during an international window. And you're telling me they're not going to call up Messi? Argentina is not going to call up Messi to uh, World Cup qualifying? I don't know if Spain's going to call up Busquets or Alba, but that is also a possibility potentially. I don't, I don't think they will, though. I, don't, I mean, even though Alba was just a part of the championship team uh, for Nations League this past summer, I don't know if they call up Alba. Depends. I, I'm actually kind of curious to see what Spain does if they're actually going to call up an MLS player. That'd be pretty wild. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Um, that that's where it gets tricky for me. Is one, how do you manage this August schedule? Because you're 
20th, 23rd, 26th, 30th, and September 3rd. Like that that's insane. And you have and then that you have LA away, you have Cincinnati away, and you have New York away. You're talking about a lot of traveling right there. It's yeah. gonna be something like these players have never experienced before. That's what like uh I'm worried about is that kind of window. And then we get into September. I think even without, if, even if Messi was to leave, I still feel pretty confident that we is with the the new U twenty pieces, U twenty two pieces, and maybe if a Busquets is still around, I still pretty, I still feel pretty confident we can win this because you have obviously Charlotte, which will probably get moved. You have New York Red Bulls, Nashville, which is going to be a tough game. LAFC, that's going to be a tough game. But then you got Sporting Kansas City, you got Atlanta United, which you already beat up on, Toronto, Orlando City. New York City, Chicago, Cincinnati, and then you ended off with Charlotte again. So you got to play the teams you have to hop to get to the ninth seat in Chicago, New York, Charlotte, Toronto, and New York Red Bulls. So you're playing a lot of teams you got to hop anyways. I think it's going to be close, man. I think it's going to come down to decision day in Charlotte. I think I it's gonna be, be really tight. We're definitely not it's gonna, the, you know, it's not it's not gonna be easy, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, with, I don't think they're gonna go eight straight and then like we're good. Like it's like I said, the, yeah, the, that was, the, travel, that was the travel and the spacing of the games really worries me. And playing through an international window. That's what worries me is playing through an international window and the spacing of the games. And then even if so, like we're playing such a tight schedule in August. Messi goes to Argentina for World Cup qualifying. Is he going to want to come right back and be right back in the thick of it? Like, immediately? I know it's his job, but, like, that's a tough ask for a 36-year-old player. Yeah, definitely. But I, I, I'm i still optimistic. I think we get in, but I, I genuinely believe we get in a decision day. I think it's going to be, like, the day of. I don't think we're going to have a couple days of, like, oh, we're chill, we're okay. We're good. It's gonna be. It's gonna have your. Ch- <laughs> it's gonna be close, man. It's gonna be close. But um, let's get into Lee's Cup as a whole. So, uh, kind of what's Adam? What's your? Th- we haven't really talked about. I know we were all me and you both like coming in, pretty much the entire season. We haven't been big fans or the idea of this tournament. We always felt like it's kind of like a money grab bullshit kind of tournament. But now that it's actually playing out. How do you feel about everything? It's still odd, especially pausing the season, you know, to do this. Uh, there's just been so many competitions, both on the uh, international level and now in club level. Um, it's been rough. But, you know, the quality of the, um, of you know, the product on the field has been good. Uh, we've been seeing some good games. We're seeing, you know, a good mix of some MLS teams really, you know, going out, dominating, playing well. We also got some of the uh, the big Mexican teams coming out, playing well. So I think it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to have a nice little mix going into um, going into the knockout stage. But I think that's when we're really going to know the answer to that question. You know, it's 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 hard to say in the group right now. But once you get down to uh, uh, silverware hour where you know you start having to play these difficult knockouts. Um, I think that's when we're gonna have a good idea of you know really how this competition worked out. But so far, I think it's it's good. It's good. Yeah. As for a fan watching it from from like more of a watching entertainment perspective. I like it. I think it's really cool. But when I kind of take a step back and look at everything that is happening because of this tournament, I, I, I still stand by the fact that I really don't like it. And I really don't like the fact that CONCACAF is giving up Champions League berths because of this. I, I still think that this is just kind of low-key a disgrace because you are forcing this schedule to be so ridiculously tight we're playing through 
we're playing through international windows, which are affecting teams. We just saw this summer, countless teams. I mean, we're doing our match predictions and we're like, we don't know who to predict because countless players are, are pulled out because of the gold cup. Then they do this. The U S soccer federation does this weird money grab game, uh, in March against Mexico for no reason outside of an international window. And now, like I was mentioning earlier with this messy thing, it's like Messi might be gone in September be for international window. And it's like, I, I, I really dislike it because we're putting, we're, we're putting this made up tournament that's clearly put together for money. And then yet we, we ruin the product of what actually of like actual MLS games. And I mean, me and you've complained about MLS scheduling for the past couple of years about, yeah, that's it's just always been bad. And now you're going to throw this thing in here, which is going to make it, which is, has made it even worse. And then you're going to give births to it, which I, I really don't like. Cause now you're, I mean, just that was always my main complaint. It was the scheduling part. I mean, standalone, like if take away all that issues, I don't have too much of an issue with the competition, the scheduling aspect and, and, and just, just the whole situation as a whole is what, is what bothers me. It's just getting worse and worse. Um, and so. Mexican teams aren't even playing in their home stadiums. These Mexican teams, I don't know if you saw that clip of the Leon team of Leon and Vancouver for on the Vancouver airport for 22 hours. Their game against LA Galaxy had to get delayed a game, a, delayed a day because they were stuck in that airport and they blamed um, something about uh, the, something with the schedulers, I guess, something with Leaks Up schedulers. And look, I'm an MLS fan, but I see on Twitter, there's just these MLS fanboys that go way too hard. And it's like they refuse to feel like they do anything wrong. And I like to think of myself as like a little bit more of a realist. I love MLS. I acknowledge where it's at quality wise and I acknowledge what they're fucking up at and what I feel like they shouldn't be doing. I think this whole lease cup thing, not playing in Mexico, like completely isolating other leagues of having no chance of like only giving birth to these pausing the schedule, forcing the teams to play in international breaks, forcing uh, games to be so damn close to where you're moving things around. And, and then clearly CONCACAF's getting a cut because they're like, yeah, I get, I don't understand if they want, if you wanted to do another tournament, which I get, even though it's already a jam packed schedule, why not do something like a Europa League? To me, that makes so much more sense. You're going to get them more games. You're probably going to get them more money still. And you're not excluding all the other countries that are in the CONCACAF region and just get like, why not just do a Europa League? Like I, where CONCACAF, and then this is, mind you too, this is even before the expanded Champions League or now CONCACAF Cup tournament that comes into play next year. Cause hmm. mind that because remember that's gonna have a that's gonna have a group stage and uh a round of 32, just like Lease Cup. This schedule's already tight of how it is with the Lease Cup in it. And now we're next season, we're about to throw in an expanded Champions League format. With this lease cup, it's gonna be even worse, dude. It's gonna be even worse. And as much as I love watching the games, and I do think it's cool seeing top to bottom teams playing. To be realistic, I mean, do we really care seeing Austin play FC Juarez? Like, like who gives a fuck? Like, we all knew that the bottom of Mexico wasn't as good as MLS. The big thing was what people want to see is the top of MLS play the top of Mexico. I don't care about fucking uh, uh, Queretaro playing fucking Minnesota. Like, I, I, I don't care. Why are we putting this tournament? Like, I don't know. It's cool to see, and I like it as a viewer, but I just feel like there's so many negatives that come along with it that it's like, I really don't like it. I feel like it's messing up everything else. And it's like, if you want to do another tournament, why not just do like a Europa League? But clearly, MLS 
This was all their diabolical plan to have yeah. a tournament in the United States to play in Mexico, bring the Liga MX fans because Liga MX is the most watched league in this country. I don't know. I, I, it just kind of bothers me. Like a lot of that kind of bothers me. And then like kind of seeing some people defend it. It's like, come on, man. Like I get, it's a cool event and I actually like watching it myself. I'm not going to lie. And, but I could take a step back and realize like this all is kind of like horseshit. Like when you look at all of it. Yeah, that aspect, you just it's hard to argue against it. It really is. I mean, hopefully next hopefully next year they at least let Mexican teams play at home. Yes, that would be nice. I mean, it's there's no way I, I I feel like there's no way they're making more money having them in the United States. Like I saw a Mazatlan versus FC Juarez. I just wanted to see what the tur- they're playing in Austin. I just wanted to see what the turnout was completely empty stadium and it's like and i I had a feeling that was going to happen like when these smaller mexican clubs play in an american stadium these are obviously teams that don't have big fan bases like club or like chivas like what do you think was going to happen i i guarantee you probably would have made way more eyeballs way more ticket sales advertising if you just let them play in their home stadiums but whatever i mean so but let's get into predictions, I guess. So uh, it seems like every team has played so far. There's still a couple teams left over that's going to go over uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday to do their final games to kind of set the groups. Here are the teams that have already advanced. Um, pull it up here. So the teams that have already advanced so far is Inter Miami, Club Leon, Mazatlan, Pachuca. LAFC and uh, Philadelphia. So those are the teams advance. And then the ones that are still fighting and figuring out um, Austin still in the, the hunt with Juarez. We have Orlando and Santos Laguna still in the hunt as long with that, that whole group, even with uh, Houston Dynamo um, Cruz Azul and Atlanta are pretty much going to go in a one-on-one to, to win it. Uh, Charlotte, uh, Nescaca, like Nick Cock. I don't know how to, those Mexican terms are tough for me. <laughs> and FC Dallas, uh, Tijuana, Queretaro, and Philadelphia. So yeah, we have a lot, but ba- who, what team has like impressed you so far, um, whether it be Mexican or American and who do you think can really make a run now that we're seeing them play? Well, aside from Inter Miami, I think I'm gonna talk about any anybody but um, Philadelphia have looked pretty good. I actually thought um, Club America, Club uh, Club America. Um, there you go. It's hard to say <laughs> Club. Uh, that that one's the club. throwing me off. I don't was like Club. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just my brain's like no. <laughs> they looked pretty good, even though St. Louis looked fairly weak in the uh in this tournament so far i mean that was still don't have pretty, klaus yes they, that was a pretty i mean they looked really good um leon looked very good i mean aside from that um aside from that uh penalty shootout that was quite the, the oh did you see that was 17, insane i 18 17 on penalty shootouts you know what actually i started laughing i know we're talking about who's going to go through but i do want to mention this i because it, it just gets me every time i could not hold in the laughter as soon as i saw the goal he's taking the penalties i just can't i love I just, it i it's, love it's, it it's so love great it but it just it. it just it just i couldn't i couldn't hold it back um oh they, did you see that last night nothing, too at nashville oh, what happened in nashville the Toluca goalkeeper scored the penalty. They had a free, uh, just a penalty kick mid game. Um, well, they just had the goalie it. take it FIFA style. They had the, go- they had the goalie take it like yeah, that's, uh, FIFA style to uh, Toluca goes on and wins the game. Cause Nashville gets a red card wins four three. But yeah, I thought that was crazy. It wasn't like it was a shootout. They just had him go up there and take it. And he, he bagged that goal. I mean, apparently he's their best freaking goal. Yeah. For, uh, penalty kick taker somehow. But yeah, um, back to uh, the picks itself. Um, yeah, aside from Inter Miami, I think that uh, the teams to worry about um, have to be Leon, Club America, 
uh, Cincinnati, uh, and um, Philadelphia. Um, there's definitely other teams that are good, but those are the ones that have impressed me or have just, you know, come out firing. I mean, the one team that is also in the same boat, but I don't really include them because I think it's the weakest group, was um, Mazatlan. Um, I think that's a pretty weak group. It's a very weak group, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably, you know, it's arguably the weakest group. So even though they are also with with um, five points and a win and then a win in penalties, um, I, I don't have them in the same boat as, let's say, a Philadelphia, even though they didn't have such great opponents either. But they, they looked really good regardless, I think. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see an issue with that there. Uh, Cincinnati, they looked great, um, and and yeah, that's 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 who I'd be worried about. Again, you know, it's it's tough with the way they're doing these games. You know, we still have um, a lot of teams that just have to play their one game, so that second spot is very much up for grabs. I mean, in three team groups, it's always going to be very close, especially when you're just playing once. You know playing against this team, playing against that team, done, moving on to the knockout rounds. So things can change, but that's what I'm thinking right so now. So what's your four? Hey, we'll, we'll keep track of this. Write this down. We'll see if, if you're, uh, you're four, and then I'll put my four and see which one wins. Well, uh, okay, so I guess one. if we're going to talk about four, I do have to put Inter-Miami in there. So I was trying to talk about teams besides Inter-Miami, but I'll say Inter-Miami... Cincinnati, Club Club America, and Leon. Really? I'm gonna go two right, and two. So here. I'm gonna go. You know, the thing with LAFC, LAFC's been on a real downturn, and they just sold some players, and they haven't played in a while, and they're gonna play for the first time on Wednesday. I honestly feel like not playing the group stage is a disadvantage. Like, I feel like that's going to be, um, I think that's not going to help them too much. We have yet to see Pachuca because obviously they're the reigning league MX champions. So they're also going with a long time. A part of me feels like because those teams have such a long break, especially Pachuca because their season just started, they played three games and now they have to take like a two week break essentially. I think Pachuca is going to get bounced. Um, but to me, the strongest showings, like you said, Club America, they they flex their muscles. They're like, don't forget, we're the biggest name on this continent. We are the most powerful fucking force on this continent when it comes to uh, on this on the field, even though they've had a little bit of a couple down years. At the end of the day, it's still Club America. Like this is this, you know, this is a big deal club. Yeah. They went in there and absolutely smashed St. Louis, is, who has been the best team in the West, the most consistent team. Granted, St. Louis is still out with their DP striker, Joe Klaus, but I think there's only so much they could have he he would have done. At the end of the day, St. Louis couldn't stop Klub at all. They're just more technical. And I, I've always said that like Liga MX, the top of Liga MX, even the best of MLS, like we can win games. But I still think those top guys, they're just more technical. Play. They're just a more technical team. They're just like, it's just, it's just better um, still. Um, but not to say that MLS can't win the whole thing. So I like Inter Miami because this whole messy effect is, is pretty wild. I like Clue. I like Monterey. Monterey, they looked unstoppable. And RSL is a team that has been, like we were talking about RSL last, last episode. They're on the rise. They've been playing super well. Um, gone on really good winless streaks. And they just got bodied by Monterey. Like, absolutely bodied by them. So, those two, I have, those are my two from the Mexican side. And then I got Miami. And then, as for my final one, who do I want to go with? Who do I want to go? Man. I don't even know if I really want to go with another MLS. Man. Yeah, nobody says you have to. The 
thing is with Philly, I want to see Philly take on a serious opponent. I haven't seen this Philly team take on like because even in Champions League, they only went through MLS team. Well, they beat Atlas. Um, they beat them, but that was kind of an Atlas who kind of got rid of their whole championship squad. So that wasn't the same Atlas who who won the title that year. Man, ah, that fourth one is tough for me. I'm going to say I'm going to go between Seattle. I think Seattle, they've been there, done that. They know how, and this Seattle Monterey game is going to be a real indicator on Sunday. That's going to be a really good game. That's going to really show how good they are. I'm going to go Seattle. I'm going to give you, you know, I'm not going to give you a fifth one. Let's just do Seattle. We'll keep it at four. So I'll do Seattle, Miami, and then I got Cluba Monterey. But some sleeper ones. I like Tigres. I like, um, I want man, I really want to say LAFC, but I I, I feel like that break is really going to hurt them. I feel like that yeah. break is going to kill them. I would I would probably either say LAFC and then Pachuca. I mean, you got to put the two champions who who skipped it. And a dark horse, I really do like Columbus. I like Columbus as a dark horse. Something about that Columbus team, I think they're built to win tournaments. But yeah, Columbus. I mean, they are. They're such a. They're such a good team, and they've really connected much quicker with um, uh, with the coach than I thought they would. Um, they have a tough game. I think the uh, we're going to really see against Club America. I think that's going to be tough. That's a good um, game, man. Good, oh no, it's Monterey. Monterey. Oh, Col- no. oh, you said Columbus. My bad. Columbus, yeah, Columbus. and Columbus. Columbus. Yeah. yeah. Sunday, gonna Sunday's going to be an awesome day. Yeah, yeah it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, we're going to we'll definitely come back to this. Uh, it's going to be interesting. So, so, you, so me and you both had so you, Miami you, you have, We both have Miami and Klub. Uh You have Monterey. I have Lyon, which I think is a good pick. I have nothing against that. Um, I have Cincinnati and you have Seattle. All right. Cincinnati's man, fuck. And now, uh, like now, I'm thinking about. I don't know why I completely forgot about Cincinnati, but Cincinnati, like you just like we're talking about. I mean, they play. We're we're recording on the day they had to finish the last thirty minutes. Yeah, it's a I mean, finish. they looked dominant against a Chivas team. Like this is a like this isn't like like Mazatlan or like FC Juarez. This is Chivas. Like, and they pretty much manhandled them. So if like, only man, they were you know around what? to play the OG MLS Chivas. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna st- I'm gonna stick with my Seattle thing. Um, but I th- I I think if I had to pick between LAFC and Cincinnati, I think I I would take Cincinnati over LAFC to make it farther. But I'm I'm gonna stick with Seattle. I think Seattle's a, it's a, it's an experienced team that knows how to win against big clubs in Mexico. But yeah, well. Let's talk about outside of um, we'll, we'll we'll move out of um, oh actually you know what I completely forgot about it. I want to bring up this athletic article and I showed it to you over the past couple of days and I feel like we should bring it up to the fans. Um, I don't know if you want to pull it up, Adam, and kind of read some of the highlights. Did you get the chance to read any of it? Yeah. So there are some pieces in there. I'm gonna pull it up myself as well that I want to bring up, but basically athletic pulled out an article and it's titled with Messi in the U S and the world cup to follow MLS owners debate roster rule changes. So there's a lot of really cool anecdotes in there and I'm basically going to summarize it. Essentially there was a meeting that they had, I guess their annual meeting uh, owners meeting and basically what came out of it was that there's a the ownerships in the MLS are are almost kind of split. I don't know if there's leaning more towards ones want to be more ambitious, ones that don't. But basically, there's a lot of owners that want rules to change. They want to be able to spend their money and how they want. They want to be able to put pieces and make things easier because they believe that they have to take advantage of the situation. Because this is a once in a lifetime situation with Messi arriving next year's Copa America. 2025 is the Club World Cup in the United States. And then in 2026, the United States. So there's some very ambitious 
And a lot of them are more so the, the newer owners. Um, so you got David Temper, Arthur Blank, uh, Jorge Moss. A lot of these more, uh, well, not even so much, but you even got some old ones in there too, like uh, Portland. Some of these owners are coming out saying like, we want to change the Ross rules. I think we're at a position where we want to progress the league forward. We have the money. We're willing to spend the money. Let us spend the money how we want as well. I mean, we're seeing, obviously, they didn't bring up Toronto, but Toronto is another one of those franchises that clearly like spending a lot of money. And MLS, for those who don't know, and a lot of you guys watching us probably do know, that... You know, there's MLS is very top heavy in the attack and lacks a lot defensively. We saw it in these Miami games in Atlanta, super strong attack. So super strong attacks. And but then the defense is super lackluster. You have defenders making 100K. Meanwhile, your strikers are millionaires. It's a it's a huge discrepancy. And a lot of uh, fans and now we're hearing owners want to change that. We want to be able to spend freely if we want to have. Our starting 11, each one of them make a million dollars, and that's $11, $11 million salary. Let us do that. If you want to have a team that only wants to pay one guy $7 million and the rest are going the hundreds of thousands, let them do that. But, um, yeah, let me bring up the exact uh, quotes. And one of the big owners that are really pushing for this, obviously, is Jorge Mas. And here's some parts where they say, um, uh, Changing and removing these rules were not discussed at depth at the board of governors meeting. However, league executive Todd Derman, main architect of the roster rules and regulations, didn't make a presentation about potential changes. And multiple team owners said after the meeting that options will be studied and discussed. That may sound underwhelming, giving Messi's immediate on-field impact, but a significant development after years of the league insisting that incremental tweaks were the only changes coming to the roster rules. Moss has been one of the loud voices on the side of opening up restrictions on how owners spend. Last week on the Board of Governors meeting, Charlotte FC owner David Temper publicly supported change as well. Yes, I would like to see roster rules, roster restrictions, less roster restrictions so we can spend more money, Temper said. Even Chicago owner Joe Monsuto said last year on The Athletic would love to see roster rules more decentralized and let owners choose how they want to allocate and spend their roster. Other owners seem to encourage a more patient approach. Houston Dynamo owner says, I think we should continue element of the discussion. Houston, obviously historically low spending team, obviously. Um, But then you have Columbus crew owner, uh, which I didn't know this. uh, Jimmy Haslam is part owner of the Columbus crew, which is the owner of the, the Browns. The Browns. Yep. And the Milwaukee Bucks. I did not know that. Um, but they said, we're involved in the NBA and the NFL. Having a hard cap is an important thing for the club to be successful and to have parity amongst the league. I think it's all up for discussion. If we can add good players, then let's add good players. That's the way I look at it. And then Portland Timbers owner uh, said that we we are optimistic and positive change, clarifying that he was speaking personally, not on behalf of the league. Um, but then here's kind of some of the... Uh, Dallas said that we should take a little bit of a slower approach. Vancouver was saying like, you know, let's not get too carried away. Let's calm down. And uh, funny enough, your boy at Colorado Rapids said that we should slow down. We shouldn't get too ambitious. We need to calm down. Like we should take a more. Let's let's not rush things so much. So it seems like some of the teams owners that you would expect are the ones that are saying hey let's calm down here yes this is a nice opportunity but let's not rush into things let's not do things but then the new guys are like no come on let's go which rightfully so you're having expansion fees out the ass now i mean every time a new team comes in we're talking about how much these expansion fees cost san diego most recently just spent a 550 million dollars to enter the league before that was Charlotte, three hundred and twenty-five million. You're having these insane expansion fees, and rightfully so. These owners are like, "I want to make my money back." And how do I do that? I bring in talent. I bring in big names. I bring people who are going to sell jerseys. 
So the way I look at it, it's like you can't be this league in MLS where you're charging astronomical amounts of money to join the league, but then you're telling owners you can't spend more than $10 million on your roster a year. It's like the fuck? Like, how am I supposed to recoup that money I just spent just in like evaluations, whatever that means? Because, I mean, even though MLS evaluations are skyrocketing, they're so high because of the potential of what soccer can be in this country. There's it's still not making the money to justify the evaluations that it's getting. And Miami's about to because Miami has a guy who can sell freaking cotton candy and it would make them millions of dollars. <laughs> so rightfully so you have guys like David Temper, the group in San Diego, you have Toronto, you, well, Toronto didn't spend that much for a, uh, but you have these more, these newer, more ambitious owners who spent a lot to join into this league. Let them spend versus you yeah, had the previous owners who basically paid nothing to be in this league. They just knew the right people and then they still don't want to spend that much. So I my my kind of thoughts on it is I really hope it changes. I genuinely believe there's gonna be something this winter. There's no way this offseason that they do nothing. It's got to be something. I'm not expecting, as much as I really, really want it to, to be a big change and just put a hard cap and a soft cap and leave it at that. As much as I want and get rid of uh, fucking you Cam, 22, get, Cam. Cam, get rid of um, international uh, spots, tra- tra- transfer, transfer fees shouldn't affect your... Transfer fee shouldn't affect your your salary cap. I think that's bullshit. I think salary should affect your salary cap, not your transfer fees. And um, get rid of trades. Like, I get trades is a big thing in other American sports, but it doesn't really work like that in soccer world. Like, it, it just it's one thing you can do that in the NFL, NBA, MLB because it's you're the best. League. That's just how it works. Draft picks mean something. This league draft picks don't mean shit because it's a world sport at the end of the day. Let teams transfer players within leagues, not for GAM, not for whatever. Let them get money for it, and then that shouldn't cost against the cap. So I hope something happens. I think something will happen this summer. I just a part of me feels like it's not going to be what everybody thinks it is. But yeah, like like the whole idea of like, um, and I'll end it here and I'll pass it to you. Is like, for example, in Miami, we had to keep Campana as a young DP so we can f- sign three U-22 initiatives. If Depo- if Campana wasn't a young DP and say we had an actual DP, like actual three DPs, um, let's say that's Alba. So say your three DPs are Messi, Busquets, and Alba. You can now only have one U-22 initiative signing. Which is stupid. It makes no sense. Why are you going to punish it like... If you have three DPs, you have three DPs. Let people have three U22 initiative slots. Why should you have to have a young DP to then use three U22 initiative spots? Because now we're in a situation where Campana is our young DP, but he's not even favored by Tata Martino. And we're really just kind of keeping him around and keeping him in that status because he offers us the ability to have these three players that are about to come in from South America. So... I hope things change because there's a lot of I get the t- the the league has been the the league had to do this back in the day because it was a way for it to survive. But the league has come so far. The infrastructure is insane. The real estate, the stadiums, the academies, the training facilities. It's just stuff like I heard David Beckham talking about it. When David Beckham came to the league, they just didn't have that stuff. Now, when Messi is coming to the league, it is so much more first world. It is on par with what we see in Europe and Asia, and parts of Latin America. It is high-quality, high-class facilities and high-quality, high-class stadiums for the most part outside of the ones that play on turf. <laughs> but I think something needs to change. But Adam, uh, give me your thoughts on kind of like this article, what you've heard, and kind of what do you expect? So I, I first of all, I totally agree with you on uh, something has to change, and this is the time to do it. I mean, if they don't, then they're just kind of missing out on a golden opportunity. Um, you mentioned some of the main points of the article, but there is one thing that I am excited about. If they don't, let's just say for argument's sake, they don't end up doing a sweeping change. The one thing that I do want them to do is 
along the lines of something that Garber has indicated earlier in the month, um, he said that they're looking at making the rules more transparent to make it easier for fans to engage I forgot the about that. as they do with the NFL, NBA, and MLB. That's that's kind of what I've been wanting. I mean, let's put it like this. How many times, how many times have I said on this podcast that one of my main gripes with the MLS is that it is impossible unless you are a a have a master's degree in sports business management, you cannot fucking play an MLS team on football manager. You can't do it because it's so fucked. It's not even funny. Like you think you're clever with the salary cap when you're releasing players. And then you realize there's some fine print where you still have to pay for them. Anyway, now you got no players and you're above the cap. You have to restart the save. It's like, you need to have a freaking doctorate to, to do that shit. And that's the key. That's what I want. I want you to make it. And yes, the NFL and the NBA and MLB, like maybe not so much the MLB, um, but you know they 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 have trades and they have drafts and they have these different rules and stuff like that and luxury tax and stuff. But it's you still understand what the fuck's going on for the most part. Nothing's like. Like, oh, they're signing him to a TAM deal and trading an international spot for their roster. Like, what the fuck? Like, you said, that's where you lose me and you lose a lot of people. Um, You can have an Americanized system with a salary cap without having it to the point where you look at the league structure and then you feel like you're losing brain cells while trying to figure it out. It's just not. It's not good. That that's always been my main concern. Um, is fix that first. I mean, if you can do both at the same time, go ahead. But first, make things more simple. Get rid of, you know, if you're not going to change the cap space or anything like that, just, you know, make it less restrictive, you know, and have it so that GAM and TAM just becomes part of the salary cap or something like that instead of having it be something separate for whatever reason, just have it part of the cap. If they're going to spend that money anyway, at least just, and that's just the bare minimum of what I'm saying. I think they're going to be looking to do a little bit more. I don't think they're just going to go bare minimum on this one. Um, you know, I, I can see why some owners are uh, not, you know, thrilled. They're, they're definitely, um, for lack of a better term, you know, uh, not exactly is seem optimistic about it. It's smart because you don't want to just go, okay, Messi's here and this guy's here, and then just completely upend it. And then when he leaves, you know, you realize that you made some fuck ups. You don't want to do that. So I completely understand it. But from the article's perspective, what I'm thinking is, um, it, it it seems like the owners of MLS are the majority are leaning towards changes. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's going to happen soon. I don't think they're going to wait much longer than, I mean, yeah, definitely after the season, but I think they're going to do something Um, whether or not it's major or not. I think it'll be somewhere in the middle if you had to ask me. Yeah. So I got two things. So yeah, I completely forgot about the transparency of the salary cap. I forgot about that. I yes, I 100% agree because for those of you who, who don't follow other American sports, that's kind of like its own fun thing to kind of do on its own. It makes it I think it makes fans feel more like involved in the team and you can kind of mess around and play around and kind of get ideas and things like as somebody I'm a big NFL fan for those who don't know, obviously on the other podcasts if you follow it then you do. Like, I love, like, when free agency is coming, which is essentially our transfer window. When that's coming, you can, like, you can look at your salary. You can look at your salary cap. You can go on uh, spot track and look at your team's current salary, where the salary cap is, and how much they're either over or under. And you can look at salary of every single player. And I think that's good for the MLS because then you can put, just like we see in other leagues, you can put the pre- the pressure then gets put on the player to be like, look, man, 
you're getting paid this much and you're affecting our cap this much. You need to perform. And I think that's something that they kind of miss in other leagues around the world is like, no one really cares how much a player gets paid. Essentially. I mean, on the surface, you're like, Oh yeah, you overpaid him English tax or whatever. But then you don't really care. Cause at the end of the day, you all know it's coming out of the owner's pocket. But when that player is getting paid a shit ton and he's getting an English tax, but then that English tax is affecting your salary cap, then you're going to think twice about paying this man an English tax. You know what I mean? And that's the one thing I like about the salary cap. Well, I mean, there's multiple reasons why I like the salary cap, but that that is one thing. It's it's putting a little bit more pressure on the players, and also uh, it it has the fans, I guess, more involved and they're putting even more pressure on the players because they're like, look, dude, you're affecting us because you're not performing. You're getting paid all this money. We can get rid of you and bring in two more players. It it turns into more like a, um, kind of like a, it, it becomes more strategized. And that's the one thing I, I like about, at least in American sports or things or sports that have salary caps is you can't just be the richest owner in the world and just like, it don't matter how much it is, just pay him this, pay him that. It don't matter, it don't matter. It's like, no, now these GMs and sporting directors and presidents, they have to sit down and think about and really strategize how we structure this team because they're going to, you know, that can set things up. So it's one thing I like. And they do need to make it more transparent. But um, go ahead, Adam, give me a second. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just like I just wanted to get your perspective on that, um, because because I know you agree just as much as I do. Um, uh, but I, I, I was just saying as you walked away, I was just saying like that was definitely something that I brought up because I I wanted to get your perspective on that. I knew that you know you you agree with me for the most part. Maybe you you know don't have like the first hand experience of of having to uh, delete a save that you've put hours into because you can't, and your mic's muted, because you can't I would imagine you know, that it would suck. advance. <laughs> because, like, literally, that's how it is. It's like, oh, you fucked up. Like, you cannot hit advance, and there's nothing you can do. Like, I'd have to, like, go into the in-game editor and just cheat, which is, like, no. Um, <laughs> you know? Okay, no, like, because the whole purpose of you doing an MLS save on Football Manager is because you want to experience the dip, or the... You, it's really the only league in the world where you can actually be a little different with it. You can, you can kind of change up, put it on hard mode, you know? And I think too, making things more simpler, I think you can also open up the door of like international sporting directors and like GMs essentially um, coming into this league. Because I think what scares a lot of even managers and like coaches and GMs is just knowing how our structure is and how difficult it is. I mean, we've seen countless international managers and sporting directors come to this league and fail because it's just too different. But then some of the most successful ones are the ones who were pretty much groomed and and developed in the MLS system. Guys like our GM, Chris Henderson, you know, like yeah. he was from yeah. the Seattle Academy. He understands he, he's been kind of indoctrinated in that versus like if you were to bring somebody from, let's say, England it's going to be a tougher adjustment for them and more likely to mess up and can, you know, get certain sanctions yeah. or whatnot put on them. But and before we, before we move on, there is one thing. And, Go ahead. I was going to say, and I get what you're saying too, with, uh, I, when you said like, I get the old owners, some of the owners being like very cautious, but it's like at the same time, what I was saying earlier, you can't expect to have these, astronomical uh what um why am i uh, uh franchise fees but then you tell these guys you can't spend more than this you know i i just think that's ridiculous because yeah, 500 you're right, it doesn't million make sense. dollars that's a lot of money that, to start a club i mean that is million, that's a lot and then you're saying yeah you can only spend 10 million on your salary it's like dude like you know what he could get. You know what team he could build with even half that amount of money. That's a that's that even half of that is I think like the wage bill of Barcelona. You know what I mean? Like that's insane. Yeah, no, it's like, it's crazy. Come on. But I I did want to yeah. say before we move on that uh, it is mentioned in the article, and I see it mentioned some some here and there, and I know it's not talked about as much anymore. But I want to kind of 
put this to bed. I'm kind of sick of hearing about it um, because it's clearly people who don't understand the situation. Um, everybody always, you know, like in the article, let me let me see um, the the line. There we go. So it says Miami remains under sanctions for breaking roster rules in 2021 only fuel speculation that the club may look to color outside the lines again. I'm the, the man who is responsible for that is gone. Okay. It is completely different soccer operations. So I'm kind of sick and tired of reading this. Oh, they might, you know, whoa, how, how are they? Oh, they did it before. How are they getting all these players now when nobody realizes that they got rid of all the problems and the and the people who made those dumb decisions and got these and we've sanctions. made the money back. So and yeah, I, I so I'm sick and tired of people saying, oh, they may look to color outside the lines again when the people, the criminals. It's like, uh, I'm trying to think. It's like imagine um, you're at a company or whatever, like some financial company, and the dude who's a stock advisor ends up doing a Ponzi scheme. And then they fire that they they catch him, they fire him, and he gets arrested. Now he's in jail. And then someone goes, "Well, they've done Ponzi schemes before, you know. What if they try and do it again?" And it's like they fucking arrested the man who was doing that. So you're gonna think that the whole company's a Ponzi scheme just because someone was caught? Like, you know, it's it's that's maybe not the best example, but I'm trying to come up with something that just no, goes. I get you. Like, you know it, what I mean, right? It, like, it's like it's not like it's an in, it's an institutional problem. It's not like something that everybody at Miami was like, OK, let's do this. This was something that kind of was was I'm sure Jorge under Moss the radar. Was advised. He was like, hey, we're going to do this, this, this. You can do this. You know, he was a new he was a new owner. It was the first season in. And then, yeah, they 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 had they hired experienced people so that they would be tr- they would have someone to trust on these issues. So you can't exactly blame them on that. Um, but I I just wanted to mention that because it was in the article, and I think that it should be known that that's kind of just a fun thing that people like to say to make them no. seem like they know what they're talking about when in reality they really don't. And you would think that. After this issue, uh, MLS would be looking pretty hard at Inter Miami to make sure that they don't fuck up again, and to to make a similar mistake on purpose. That that's just that's just stupid. I don't want I don't want to no. hear any of that. I think that's just no, uh, you, it's just for talk. So no, yeah, I feel you because I I hate the ignorance that you're seeing from like these people who clearly don't know the rules or don't know anything. And it's like, if you actually did two minutes of research, you would realize how we're able to do these things. And yeah, don't you think that we would be under a microscope after what uh, yeah. happened a couple of years ago? And it's like, dude, do like the tiny, because everybody's like, oh, how are they affording? They, what, now they have six DP spots? Like, bro, it's not my fault that your owner has left you guys in the dust and refuses to like out, go out there and actually purchase players. So you don't know how to actually manipulate. And I don't even want to say manipulate, but how do you actually stay within the rules because you can actually do be a lot more flexible than you think at the end of the day look the reason why look you we bought we terminated contracts with pizarro that was it he wanted to leave he knew he wasn't going to play time we we didn't want him he knew he was going to be gone boom clears that even if we wanted to use a buyout we could have you buy down gregory would again now boom yeah bessie and busquets you're going to keep campana because he's a young dp when you have one young dp you have three U22 initiatives. One of our U22s and Emerson Rodriguez is loaned out to Santos Laguna. Since he's loaned out, that does not affect us on the salary cap. We can keep these three players. Jordi Alba, he's going to be on a TAM deal. That's kind of right? LGP's but, on loan too. Yeah, and we're paying for him. But uh, Alba, he's on a TAM deal. How is he on a TAM deal, some might ask. There's no way he's playing for 1.6. The dude in a part of his release clause from Barcelona says he's getting, they, they like, mutually what, agree. Thirty fucking million. He's getting, he's getting thirty-five million. So yeah, he's getting thirty-five million for Barcelona. It's okay for him to come here and play for one point six. If you're make if he's if basically Barcelona's footing the bill for his and it's a family decision. Salary. He's probably having just as much fun as Messi and his family. He gets to live yeah. here and he's still in a nice paid. place. 
and he'll have no problems. He'll have plenty of money to live here. Um, yeah, Miami is gonna... you know expensive place, but I mean, come on now. And so, with these with these young DPS and U twenty twos, you only take three hundred thousand on the salary cap. Campana's only taking up three hundred thousand on the salary cap. All three of these other ones are like I think it's three hundred and twenty thousand, and then after that, you can pay them whatever you want. Just like with a normal DP, it's six hundred and fifty something, and then it does, that, those. So realistically, yeah. So Campana is on a young bill, DP, and then we have Josef Martinez. Um, who Atlanta Messi. is footing their build. Yeah, Messi uh, and Busquets as the actual designated players. Yeah, because Joseph Martinez is technically a TAM under us because Atlanta's footing the bill for him. Um, so, yeah, I, I just I, I hate that these people who don't know the team don't know anything because they fucking live in a market where no one want, no player wants to go to like fucking Kansas City or Cincinnati or whatever the fuck. I don't know. No, no disrespect to those fans, but at least the ones that are upset that come from those whatever the fuck cities that no one wants to go to you don't get mad at us and say that we're cheating because your owner doesn't want to spend the money and then you don't have players that are willing to want to go or take pay cuts because the market that you're in that that like that that's what i'm with you though that it's just annoying but hopefully we don't even have to worry about that next summer because or next winter and they just change things outright I have a feeling that's going to happen because a part of me feels like we're going to find a way to keep Joseph, whether it be Joseph getting on a cheaper deal, maybe actually play being a TAM, or if they just fix it, they change the rules to where you can spend however the fuck you want as long as it's in within 30. I don't even think 30 hard cap and 20 soft cap is that even big of a deal, especially with the revenue these teams are making and how much these owners are wanting to spend. And I think a lot of them are okay with that. Like, that's not that insane. It's not like NFL where your salary cap is like 180 million. I mean, you're talking about 30 million to these billionaires. Like, come on. Like, it's not that like serious, like at the end of the day. And clearly some owners feel that way as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, no, it was, it was an interesting topic. i um, glad we touched on it. We definitely touched on all the major, um, points of that article and uh, once they make any changes we will definitely talk about it um so, so there's not talk- much yeah we're going to talk about uh the rest of the world now and really there's not much going on besides uh, more saudi money so i you were mentioning before the podcast that mana is going to join ronaldo but um jordan henderson also is going to is leaving liverpool getting a lot of hate from uh from the lgbtq community because he was such an like like went out of his way to be an advocate for those for those people and had so many quotes that made you think that he would be completely against going to saudi arabia now you have that going on and then you know with with saudi arabia not getting um not landing messi that being a big loss for them you know they really wanted to have messi and Ronaldo playing in their league to reignite that rivalry. And that was huge for them. So they had all this money sitting around. They were basically offering PSG a $300 million or 300 million euro transfer fee, just a transfer fee, and then giving him a 700 million euro a year salary. Um, he, but the big news was Killian said he would literally rather not play for a year than to go to Saudi Arabia. So a lot of people have um, thrown praise his way. I got to be one of those people too. I mean, that is that, I mean, come on now, that's a freaking huge decision. He's essentially being offered a billion to become a billionaire to go and play in Saudi Arabia. And the man is, is saying, I'd rather even not play for a year. Just chill and watch it. I mean, that is a powerful statement. Um, so, I mean, that's just, it's just worth mentioning. And, but my question to you is, do you think, cause I, I and I'll give you my answer after, cause I have my own theories about this. Um, do you think that this, affects Saudi Arabia's overall strategy for signing big players. Do you think that Mbappe, well now with Mbappe and Messi both denying Saudi Arabia, do you think those two misses are big enough 
to cause them to struggle getting these top players uh, in the next couple of years? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it's going to affect them. I think, I think at the end of the day, I think they're always going to struggle with the the massive, super global stars like Messi, like Mbappe. I mean, they were able to get Ronaldo because at the time, no one was giving that before. So, um, they, I can see them even giving that to somebody like Holland. But outside of those guys, I mean, I get why some of these maybe European stars who are big names, you know, but like outside of if you're not following the soccer world, you're not going to know who they are. Like Amane, for example. Um, like these are big stars, don't get me wrong. But like if you don't follow soccer, you wouldn't know who they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, those guys, I think they're always going to get those. As long as they're willing to spend the money. Like at the end, I think, I think the gap between what they would get paid staying in Europe versus going to Saudi Arabia is just too big to pass up for how much they've made in their total career earnings. But someone like an Mbappe, and we kind of, I kind of said this with like the messy thing. It's like, what is one point two billion to him? It gets to a point where the money is it's no different. Well, yeah, like, for someone it, like Messi, yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm saying. And then same thing for Mbappe. Mbappe signed what four hundred million dollar deal, um, or four hundred million dollar euro, euro. I keep on saying dollar euro deal with um. PSG, what, two years? Yeah, last year? Like, this is a guy who's always going to have hundreds of millions of dollars just through his salary, let alone what he's going to make through his World Cup earnings, what he's going to make through sponsorship deals, so on and so forth. And, I mean, I've always heard this from an accountant. He was like, um, and he, he was a very, like, good accountant, like, very well. We worked with a lot of big money clients. He and or I think he was a financial advisor. I don't know. He worked with a lot of millionaires, like big money people. And one thing he's noticed after you know advising all these people in financial, once you're making about 10 million plus more a year, there's pretty much everything in the world you can get. It doesn't your life doesn't change. Once you're making 10 million a year. Your life doesn't really change. There's not much more you can do. Very few things. But even then, not much more you can do. So a guy who's already made hundreds of millions of dollars going to a year to Saudi for $700 million, it's not that big of a deal. Mbappe's life's not changing. It's like, what, he's going to sit miserably, waste a year, and... uh get so much hate and say that he won't because I think Mbappe's goal at the end of the day, he wants to be the best, the greatest to ever live and play. And he wants to reignite and start this new thing with like Holland where they're both kind of like the new Ronaldo Messi. He wants he he and he feels that, you know, I'm not obviously I'm speculating, but he probably feels that if he goes to Saudi Arabia, his brand's going to tarnish. And I think he cares more about his brand and winning a Champions League and his legacy more so than going to Saudi Arabia because at the end of the day, yeah. money's still money. He's still going to make a ton of money. What, like I said, the money doesn't matter at that point. I, I At least I feel like like the money doesn't matter. And especially if you're coming from a European background, that's already kind of instilled in their culture, you know, where it's like, it's more community more so. And it's not like America, for example, where there's a lot of, individualism where it's like it's always about being the richest man ever or whatever versus like when you come from like you got people like Messi or whatever you come from people who come from communities where like countries and societies where it doesn't matter that much it's not like Saudi Arabia where it's you you know these freaking oil princes or whatever the fuck like (laughs) have so much money I think money can only take you (laughs) money will only attract people so much to where it's just like, dude, it doesn't matter. It's like, I'd rather go to Real Madrid and push for a Champions League title at the end of the day. But I will say this, if he went to Saudi Arabia, I would not have faulted him if Mbappe went. A lot of people would have trashed him. I would have not. I, I would have been like, dude, it's one year. Who gives a fuck? Like, I, like and he's coming right back. He's going to be, what, 25? Like, who cares if he went for one year? 
So I will say that I wouldn't have cared if he gone, but um, I think it's cool that he stayed. I think it is a statement, but I don't think it's going to stop other older players who just want to get probably the biggest paycheck of their yeah, life. Exactly. Over there. Like, and, and there's only, like I said, there's only very few people who have the ability to turn that down. Like, you know what I mean? There's not very many people that can turn that down. Yeah. Ronaldo so could have, but he decided because, but obviously that was an anomaly because he was the very first one. I don't know if he would have took it like now looking back at it, like if he offered it again, or maybe he would have, I don't know, but yeah. So that that's, that's why I mentioned Henderson at the beginning. So my, I would agree with you and say that it's not going to affect it because yeah, you got people who have so much money and I'm not saying that like there's other players. I mean, you, you if you're someone like Jordan Henderson, you don't, you really don't need to go to Saudi Arabia. I know you're not Mbappe, you're not Messi, but you really don't need to. So that's why I agree with you, and I don't think it's going to affect it because it's always going to be tough to entice the Mbappes and the Messis when they're just so big and have so much money that it's just hard. And especially at that point in someone like Messi's career, where he's like, I don't give a shit. I'm 36. I want to. You know, want to have a good time. I, mean, I, I Messi's like I've already made six hundred million dollars. Yeah, like, it's like I want to have a, I want to have a good time. You know, like I want to I want to enjoy myself. I don't want to have to deal with this stuff. So when you have, you know, someone like uh, a Jordan Henderson who just kind of says, you know what, fuck it, and then goes, I don't. I think that tells you all you need to know about Saudi Arabia, and it tells you all you need to know about how they're going to be able to get on as long as they still have the money to um, i think they're always going to get so that's so that's my thought on that um it's interesting that he didn't he didn't you know mbappe didn't want to go i mean obviously i think that's a positive um but yeah go ahead what were you gonna i was gonna say add? i think you're always gonna get the sadio manes of the world yeah i think you're always yeah, gonna get those point. guys but yeah. here's the one thing though like look the thing with saudi arabia too at the end of the day the one problem that they're always going to have, yeah, you can throw all the money in the world, but the one problem is who wants to live there? That's that's the issue. Nobody. And, and that's family the, and, sure as hell didn't want to. And that's the one event, and that's why I hate the whole Saudi Arabia is better than MLS. Okay, yeah, maybe the guys they just signed, but adding 10 to 15 players Long term is not... not Adding 10 to 15 players does not make a league better. It makes a team better. It does not make a league better. I, you go and look at the the transfer market values of these bottom tier Saudi Arabia teams. Their market value for some of these rosters are like 100000 So talk about the discrepancy of the bottom tier not even reaching half a million to the top being hundreds of millions. That just because you have four teams, five teams, whatever that paid exorbitant amount of money to these old players, that does not make a league better. I don't know what people like, bro. This is a league that, yeah, they have promotion relegation, but like, let's be real. Like, what the hell's on that second division? I think they're also paying people. Like, I saw something, I don't know if you saw, like, um, for the second and third division, which they're basically what they're trying to do is just fill it out because there essentially is no second or third division is they're trying to offer players $4,000 a year, a house. And like, uh, I think that's what it was, a house, a car and the salary of $4,000 a year. So I'm like, I mean, that's not bad for, especially if you're a struggling footballer and the fifth division of, I don't know, Italy, it's like, oh man, I can go to Saudi Arabia, get a house, and but I think lifestyle will always trump everything, man. Especially for these, it's like I think that's one advantage MLS and just America will always have is people actually want to be here. People want to be in Miami. People want to be in Los Angeles. People want to be in New York, San Francisco, whatever. Like that's always going to be that inherent advantage, and I think Saudi Arabia realizes that so they have to pay these absorbent amounts but like so you're gonna have some players that are gonna be there for you but like there's no long-term success in that i mean your saudi arabia will never have what david beckham did to the mls yeah yeah they totally. will never have that david beckham went to los angeles had all the glitz and glamour and the lifestyle of being in america decided to stay here build a team here in miami and recruit players 
I just I would do not believe they'll ever have that. And that's what you need. Saudi Arabia doesn't have academies. They're not selling young talent. They're not like like I can't stand these like Euro snobs that think, oh, you fucking pay for 15 people and all of a sudden the league's better. Like, no, it's not how that works. There's literally no infrastructure over there outside of like th- four teams. There's no true pyramid true true pyramid. Not like there's one here either, because we don't have pro rail, but like, like, come on, man. And I don't know. I mean, shit's wild. But it uh, it's probably not going to end anytime soon. Um, it's going to keep on going. Uh, but, I mean, it's kind of like what I was telling this one guy. I think you were there with me. Or it's like, at the end of the day, the Saudi stuff is just not sustainable. All it takes is for the government to be like, ah, let's move on to our next project. I mean, we've seen it time again with time and time again with these these uh these nations and these oil nations in the Middle East, they want to start this big ambitious project. They maybe they get halfway through it and then they're just like, nah, let's move on to the next big ambitious project. It's a very 50 50 shot if they finish it or not. Look at the freaking world of islands in Dubai. Like they never finished that and they've spent probably billions of dollars on that. And it's like, all it takes is for Saudi Arabia and the government to be like, you know, we don't feel like doing that anymore. And then we just pull out and do something else. And that's why I like, I just don't feel like that's stuff sustainable. And people are like, oh, they just have so much money. It doesn't matter. I'm like, no, they can easily just be like, we don't feel like it. Because it's not like the live golf thing where they just, just straight out just own golf now. Like, but that tour is all over the world. You know what I mean? It's not just in Saudi Arabia, but yeah. But um, yeah, any final thoughts, Adam? I think we covered it all. We had a lot going on this uh, these past couple of weeks. You know, when we think that we have nothing to talk about because it's the off season, you know, shit just keeps happening. So glad we that we, yeah, an hour yeah. And a half. We, we can we find always, we, can... we always find something. But you know, it is nice to have big topics like Messi and Mbappe to talk about in the off season. It, yeah. it is nice. Well, we're coming up on preseason, man. So maybe next episode we we give some predictions. Maybe for uh, you talk about some of the Champions League kind of like guys that we're seeing. You talk some Arsenal, talk some Barcelona, move from Dembele, I don't know, Real Madrid. What are they going to do at the number nine position? Like, I mean, we got we got some uh, things cooking up. So as the season gets closer and closer, I mean, how many weeks are we away? Probably about a month away. Oh, for the from the season, yeah, like the Euro, no, European well, season for, for England. It's earlier. I mean, Arsenal's got a uh, community yeah, it's shield. About, it's, it's about mid mid August, right? Arsenal has community shield on the sixth of August, and the week oh, after that is the first league. So we are we are getting close. Um, so I guess. Uh, Soon, I guess our next episode, we're gonna have to do a uh, definitely a Premier League preview. Yeah, um, I'm down to do that, and maybe because I, like, I think they are. The, the, I don't know. I have to double check to see when the leagues start, but I know England starts pretty early. I think Germany might be up there as well. Um, everyone else is a little later, but we'll. I, I yeah. do need to double check it, but we'll we'll, we'll <laughs> talk about that. So tune in next week. Yeah. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. but uh yeah i do want to thank everybody for uh, if you've listened to the end of the video uh, or end of the podcast or listen to the end of it uh i want to thank you for doing that and um if you have make sure to you know subscribe like the video if you're listening on audio platform you know leave a rating leave a review if you're on apple Podcasts. leave a rating on spotify so on and so forth you guys know what to do um but yeah appreciate you guys and we'll see you guys in the next one peace out everybody